My name is John Lowy. I'm 84 years old and worked with dolphins for many years. I'm going to show a video of the beginning of love between men and dolphins, in which Margaret Howe is teaching two dolphins to speak English. They don't do very well. <laughs> You'll see in the movie what, how well they do this. And no pleasant delight, let's see the video. This work was done in the early 1960s in the Virgin Islands in the United States. perceptions of dolphin intelligence has been Dr. John Lilly. Trained as a neurophysiologist, Lilly earned an early reputation for mapping out the pleasure and pain centers in the brain. Lilly has claimed that the large brain dolphins and whales have an intelligence far more advanced than our own. Lilly died in 1954. And after a year of that, I decided I needed to work with somebody to stay 24 hours a day floating around. So I went to a peace show and there biologist and he said, Dolphins, down in Greenland, Florida. So I went down, sure enough. Then brings larger than ours, and 24 hours a day floating around. I thought, boy, they must meditate. Very peculiar things, you know? Yeah. Totally unique that we don't know anything about. And what else are much larger brains must be much further out than we are. For the various brains, the man on the left, uh, the dolphin on the right, the monkey in the middle, the cat on the left, and the dog on the right. Now you can see that the dolphin brain is folded. Uh, it's a more spherical form than ours. The weight of the human brain on the left was 1,400 grams. The dolphin on the right was 1,700 grams, the larger brain. And you can see that the cortex is uh, very complex, fissured the way ours is, and even more so. Now if we had a whale brain, say a sperm whale, it would be uh, six times the size of ours. Ooh. So that in the sea, there's a whole spectrum of brain sizes. Been on the planet an hour of brains our size, 25 million years. We haven't been here that long. We've only been here with our present brain size about uh, two-tenths of a million years. 
So they've been here, you know, something of the order of 25 to 50 to 100 times the length of time we have. And I just want to talk to such ancient characters and find out, you know, if they have any wisdom for us. In 1960, we began to realize that the dolphins wanted to communicate with us. By 1963, we were exploring the communication through bodily motions, through contact, as well as voice communication. St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. We start with an historical sequence taken in the laboratory of the Communication Research Institute from 1960 to 1963. The pool is a sea-fed, seawater pool, fed by the waves, brought into a wave ramp. The water changes every two hours, and as you can see, the dolphins are quite happy. Here we see David Lilly Jr. in his first contact with the dolphin, Sissy. Sissy was with us from age six months for seven years. In this sequence, Sissy is attempting to get David into the deep water. This is his first contact with a dolphin, a rather revealing one. If he had been instructed by Margaret Howe to stroke Sissy carefully and pay attention to what Sissy wanted which she would indicate by unequivocal bodily motions. Here Sissy is looking at the camera. She was quite a clown and seemed to know whenever the motion picture camera was running. David was a little frightened and didn't want to go in the deep water. So Sissy accommodated him, climbed on his lap, and exposed him to her 400 pounds of weight. Here she's inviting him in the water by other means. Here she brings with him her ball, flips it from her mouth under her left flipper, and dares him to take it away from her. There you can see it under the flipper, the orange ball. Here, John is going in with Sissy. She's sonaring his body to find out what he looks like. Here she is mocking John swimming, swimming in a tight circle around him, mocking his dog paddle. <laughs> Here, Patty Birch pretends to be drowning, challenging Sissy to rescue her, and here's how Sissy did it put her right flipper under Patty and then pushed her at very high speed, lifting her head out of the water and pushing her up onto the bank. She then wouldn't let Patty back in the pool for about a half an hour. <laughs> Here Ben is doing the dolphin swimming and Sissy is swimming alongside of him under the water. Here is just a loving contact with Ben stroking her underneath her jaw and her chest and here on her back. Here Ben pushes Sissy sidewise. Sissy gets rather vigorous and hits him over the head. Notice the intense concentration of effort on Sissy's part. Here she's pushing him backwards sidewise. And then climbing on his back. This is George, who's treating Sissy very tenderly, stroking and massaging her between her flippers. George was very gentle with Sissy. You can see the stoned appearance that she gets as a result of George's tender ministration. puts her feet on his shoulder and goes in a circle around him in the deeper water. Mm -hmm. 
This very tender scene is terminated when Sissy suddenly swims with great power in a circle and pushes George off the platform on which he's standing. And he grabs on and starts stroking her belly again. This is Lois Bateson in her first contact with Sissy, once again in the shallow water. Sissy realizes that Lois is a little anxious and treats her very gently, keeping her in the shallow water and not putting her full weight in Lois's lap. She's apparently just waiting to be massaged. Boy on a dolphin. This is dolphin riding a boy. <laughs> it is these kinds of interactions that convince us the dolphin to want to communicate. Sissy is mocking Margaret Howe's swimming here. Margaret spent two years with Peter Pan and Sissy, swimming with them and working with Peter on voicing English. <laughs> Uh, she was teaching this particular dolphin how to count in English. Now, uh, there are very interesting things happen. He would learn to count from one to ten. Then you'd give him a sequence of integers, say three, four, five, and he'd give you the next one. And then finally he'd change the rules and you'd give him three, four, five, and he'd give you four, two, one, count backwards. In blowing air and back and forth through narrow slits, they create sound, they create whistles, they create clicks, they create trains of clicks. In producing sounds, they do not need to release air. They blow the air from one set of cavities into another set of cavities, just behind the melon, which is that protuberance above the jaws and in front of the eyes. They have at least four and possibly five sonic emitters, each one of which is independently controlled. Two dolphins talking together can sound like four individuals. Each of the sound producers can either whistle or click or make trains of clicks. The dolphins speak at 10 times our frequencies and 10 times our speed. In the next sequence of film, superimposed upon this picture of the dolphin swimming in the water, you will see two yellow-green traces, each one of which represents frequency from the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side. The upper trace is the frequencies in real time as produced by the dolphins slow down ten times at one-tenth the frequency so that we can hear them. Get acquainted with dolphins so that they will work with you. We swim with them. 
this broken, we massage them. We are establishing ourselves as their friend. And they will work very hard for their friends, but will not work very hard for people that are more remote or who are strangers. The program is called Janus, for the two-faced Roman god, which one face faces dolphins, the other face faces the humans. Since dolphins speak best underwater and we speak best in the air, we must adapt to this. The aims of the research program try to establish a communication, but here we prefer to teach them a language, a third language, neither Dolphinese nor human language. The human operator here, John Kirk, in the mobile laboratory beside the dolphin pool, is using the computer to generate the sounds of genius. Here you can hear some of these sounds. You can also see the symbols appearing on the screen as the computer interprets the sounds going out to the doll. In a similar way, the computer interprets the sounds coming back from the dolphins as they emit their sounds. I assign specific frequencies within the dolphin's hearing range to each letter of the alphabet in numbers. And they combine those into words. So words, when you reduce the frequency so that humans can hear, each word has its own little melody. And it's really nice, it's really romantic. The man says fish in 09 hours, 50 minutes, 29 seconds. You see the letters series of F's, G, H, I, which is what the computer puts out for the human word fish spoken into the microphone. You then see the dolphins reply below that at 09.50.34. And here we see I, J, and then a series of A's, B, D, now this is not a good match. In other words, when the man said fish, a sequence of frequencies represented by the F's, the G's, the H, and the I's occurred. The dolphin said something, which is a success. He said things which correspond to I, J, and then the frequencies went very low, A, B, A, B. This is five minutes later in the same session, and here at 09.55.19, the human puts out ball, and here we see a series B, C, D, E, and the dolphin now answers. In the next sound produced by the dolphin, you see at 09.55.25, he starts with a J, K, then an A, and then comes down to the B, C, D, E sequence. So the latter part of the dolphin sounds match those of the humanly generated, Janus generated sounds. This is the underwater monitor on which the dolphins can see themselves and see the output symbol. The symbols are being created in a much larger size for ease of seeing them. The sounds for each one of these symbols are coming out in the human range here and in the dolphin range here underwater, which is way above your hearing. You cannot hear these sounds. The dolphins will work for about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, concentrate on the task which we impose upon them, and then suddenly will leave and relax. Here a dolphin is sitting on the bottom watching the monitor and relaxing from the task, but at the same time producing sound. The human operator on the left, Jennifer, and the dolphin in the water are interacting here. Jennifer is speaking into a microphone, which goes to a computer and then generates an underwater sound in the dolphin's hearing range. Through channel, through square.
almost five years. We're really happy to be in Gulf. Joan Mosley, we're from uh, Gulf here, and it's very uh, happy here. There's a new phase in the Human Gulf Foundation Research Program. And we hope to convince me that Joan Rose will join their friends out in the Gulf. Returning dolphins to their natural habitat is not simply a matter of setting them free. Years of captivity have dulled their wild instincts. They have grown dependent on humans for their very survival. Readaptation is more involved than meets the eye. We're finding the best way to do it is to put them in a place like this where there's a tide, a simple thing like that, the tide, is something they have not been exposed to, Joe and Rose, for the last uh, six years, I think it's been. They've been in a tank in California. They need to remember how to chase fish, which are much more nutritious, incidentally. These live fish than the frozen uh, herring and cable and various things we feed them. Joe and Joe! That's what they got to do in the wild. Joe and Rosie were captured in 1980 for a human-dolphin communication experiment that ended four years later. The plan was to return the dolphins to the wild, so Orca was formed, then to supervise the readaptation part of the project. The dolphins have been freeze-branded. Joe wears an arrow. Rosie, a circle. The symbols will be important for identification once they go back to the wild. Well, I've been hanging out with them all of my adult life. I spent the majority of that time capturing them and training them. Now, I have the opportunity to untrain them and put them back in their normal environment, which is just wonderful. Instant karma, you might say. I, I thought it would have to come back next lifetime and we could straighten all that stuff out. There was a deep rationale to pursue readaptation and release, and that to me has to do with a kind of agreement or promise that we make with another species. Honoring the promise that was made to return Joe and Rosie to the wild is honoring that kind of commitment, that kind of relationship. Now the final phase begins. Joe and Rosie are in the last pen that will hold them before they gain their freedom. As long as we have them boxed in the pen and we feed them the fish they like, they're going to stay here and um, express some sort of fondness for us, or at least we would interpret it that way. But not until they go out and swim in a straight line for a mile and catch all the fish they want, and we sit here and wonder, are we going to know about the truth of the relationship? And that's what this is about. You Joe and Rosie have spent over seven years in captivity. They have lived for a month in this floating pen. Finally, their day has arrived. Just below the surface of the murky creek, the gate is lowered. The bars come down. The gate is all the way down now, and they're free to leave at the time they want to. At last, nothing stands between them and the open water. <laughs> Five minutes go by. Human ears, accustomed to the repetitive sound of dolphins, strain to pick up Joe and Rosie's voices on the wind. The dolphins return twice. <laughs> then they headed for the open sea. In the days and weeks that followed, they were spotted first alone, then in the company of local wild dolphins. They never again returned to the pen. We have a perceived 
dark skies as being the superior ones on this planet for a long time. Uh, we as human beings need to experience but then develop humility. And I think that if we go through the exercise of trying to communicate with another species, we get our humanness in perspective. My hope is to be able to develop a community with humans and dolphins. Children are beautiful with dolphins. I have a sense that a third language can be developed much more readily and easily while a child is forming their own language. Dolphins have a, a very an unusual, unique sense of harmony. I think we can learn an awful lot about ourselves. different culture 
And then, uh, while I was there, I happened to notice that uh, the company I was working for was named Echosys. And if you're familiar with Dr. Lewis' writings, you'll know that that is the Earth Coincidence Control Office. And uh, whether you believe it or not, it seemed to work for me. And they said, well, would you like to meet Dr. Lilly? And then they also said that they were interested in um, <coughs> presenting his works on the internet because um, there's 12 full-length books and 200-some uh, scientific briefs. And most of them are out of print and hard to find. So we're working now to make this all available to the general public. And so uh, I had the good fortune to go and live with Dr. Lilly and read a lot of the materials. And uh, if I could have